Welcome to the record. It is presented by Ketamelon Ventures and 314 Capital. Today, we are going to have a conversation with Mr. Inna Narayan Murthy on creating a world-class organization. Sir, you created Infosys, a world-class organization which won the respect of people all around the world. Now, when you set about creating Infosys, what was in your mind when you created a founding team? What did you look for in people uh, to create the team? And what are the guiding principles that you had as you went along and kept the team together? Well, uh, Infosys was founded as my second attempt in entrepreneurship after I understood that the only way a country can make economic progress is through entrepreneurship. The first company, Softronics, was a failure because I had not truly estimated the market demand properly. And I closed it once I realized that there was a structural problems with the market. When I founded Infosys, it was to conduct an experiment in entrepreneurship or in the success of entrepreneurship in an environment that at that time was not business friendly. Second, I wanted to create a company of the professional, for the professional and by the professional as Abraham Lincoln defined U.S. democracy in his Gettysburg Address. Now, I realized that in creating such a company in the then environment of India was not going to be an easy one. By and large, it was family environment. By and large, it required a lot of connections with government. By and large, it required to be pliable with the authorities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So therefore, I knew the challenge would be big. I knew that there was much sacrifice to be made. I knew that it required deferred gratification. I knew that it meant hard work and discipline. And most importantly, I also realized that the people who exhibit these values should be competent. 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 So therefore, I looked for competence, intelligence, and of course values. That is why, Mohan, if you remember, the first byline of the company was powered by intellect, driven by, driven by values. Because intellect and values form the two most important time invariant and context invariant attributes of a successful professional. So I picked people, thought, were competent and had values. And these were uh, people much younger than me. They are, they are hardly one or two years of experience, except one person. But none of those things matter to me because values are imbibed from your family, your parents, grandparents, uncles, all of that, and siblings, mother and father. Second, from your early school teacher. And second, Competence and intellect helps you to learn new ideas, uh, uh, obtain new knowledge with minimum effort. And that's what I defined as learnability, the ability to extract generic inferences out of specific instances and use them in new unstructured situations. So I had observed the colleagues, uh, uh, not all of them, but definitely most of them, in a situation where they had expressed learnability, 
and I had also observed them in situations where they demonstrated values, and so I formed my initial team. There were seven of you. Yes. I mean, what is the right size of a founding team now that uh, uh, you know it's been many many years since you founded Infosys? Because we would like young founders uh, to listen to you are listen to what you have to say yeah. and do things for themselves. What is the right size of a founding team? Why did you have seven people? You know, right from the beginning, money didn't matter much to me. Control didn't matter much to me. Uh, what percentage of shares I held didn't matter to me. Because if you remember, when I started, I just kept 30% and distributed the rest to the remaining six. Why is that? I mean... I mean, that is extraordinary. I have not seen any other founder. No, it say, has not happened in the world anywhere. Yes. Where, because, they, you know, Chris, Nandan, Shibu, they, they had hardly one or two years of experience. And I was a manager six to seven levels above them. Yes. The reason why I did was simply because I enjoyed the journey of creating this company. I enjoyed their the, uh, bantering with them. I enjoyed problem solving with them. I enjoyed facing challenges with them. And that's what, fortunately, both my wife and I enjoyed it. We, neither of us, was focused on money, on control, on having shares, you know, largest number of shares. N not really. And uh, I must say that uh, this was uh, probably the only such experiment conducted in the world, if not definitely in India, but maybe in the world, because my values were focused more on the experiment of entrepreneurship rather than who makes what money. But why seven? Well, that's a very good question. You know, a, frankly, probably that was a large number. When I first thought of, I thought of just four. Oh, just four. Just four. That's when uh, uh, Raghavan, Chris, and Nandan were the three people in that order that I invited. And then I realized that we had these extraordinary people in Dinesh, in uh, Shibulal, and uh, in Ashok Arora. So somehow that fairness issue in me kicked in. I said, look, in fact, Mohan, I would say my biggest regret is that we did not have you as a founder because you added so much value to Infosys that it is very, very difficult for me not to think of and acknowledge it almost on every occasion. So therefore, here were these uh, three youngsters. They were going to be doing the same thing as what Chris and Nandan and Raghavan were supposed to do. So I said, how can I say you come in as senior project managers or, and not as uh, you know, founders? So it was the sense of fairness in me that said, I need to later on, you know, they were all given 7% in the beginning. Yeah, while Nandan beginning. and Chris had 15 and Raghavan had 19. Yeah. But I, I fought and unfortunately, for whatever reason it is, I, had, I could convince only Raghavan that he had to give up three. But I said, look, I'm giving up six. Yes. I'm not asking you, I told all the people that I'm giving 6% of my equity, 20%. What I'm asking you is also to give only 20%. But it didn't work out. So therefore, uh, my 6% and Raghavan's 3% was distributed among all these three people and Dinesh, Shibulal's and Ashokarara's 
equity was taken from 7% to 10%. And it was always just a sense of fairness. There was nothing else involved. And in you that. could have refused. You could I have, could have, of course, of course. And nobody would have asked you no. why you are such a last share. No, 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 no. I mean, I was six to seven levels above them. I was... Uh, I was offered a professorship at IIM Ahmedabad in 74 when probably Nandan was in his second year B.Tech or something. Chris was uh, just doing his B.Sc. or something like that. Shibulal were, were all studying. So I, I don't think there was that issue. It was just that there was a sense of fairness in fairness. me. And I enjoyed experiencing this marathon much more than money. So, we, so your message to your founder is you have to be generous, yeah. you have to be fair, you have to be seen as fair yeah. if you want to have a founding team. Absolutely. That's a very well summed up. You know, leadership, by example, is the best instrument. And in that, it is very, very important for a leader to be very generous. To be generous. Very generous. At his own cost, his own cost. There is no issue of, you see, Mohan, there is an end to your need, but there is no end to your Agreed. greed. Therefore, whether you have X amount of money or Y amount of money, it doesn't matter. And as I'm growing older, I'm realizing more and more that I can eat less. <laughs> I don't need more than one room. I don't need more than one car. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. What is the ideal uh, now, uh, if you want to advise some young people, young person who wants to start a team, what is the ideal size you would say? I would, you know, I've discussed this with several people, including some of the largest, some of the most important founders in the world. I think Three to four would be sufficient. Three to four would be sufficient. So but good. you need a founding team. It cannot be one person. Yeah, I, I personally feel that uh, you need to build relationship with people with whom you can share your joy, with whom you can share your sorrow, with whom you can discuss your challenges. That's very important. And that's what, of course, one is the family. Obviously, uh, your wife is there. It is better to have another two or three people with whom you can share your challenges. And that, that's my view. And number two, I think uh, by having a set of angsters with you, you, are, you feel more confident, you feel more... Uh, 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 of youth and you feel a better sense of energy. A, a peer group is better or a group where some people are younger? No, I don't believe in peer group because most peer groups I have seen have disintegrated. Oh, really? Yeah. Why is that? Maybe it is the culture. The moment you have a set of people, all of whom passed out of the same institute at the same time. There is always a feeling of, who is this fellow to tell me what to do? Because the leader must be the unchallenged leader. Unchallenged leader. Absolutely. And to, to earn that uh, uh, privilege, a leader has to sacrifice more than other people. You know, I took one-tenth my salary when I founded Infosys and I gave all others 20% more. So that gave me an authority. The to, moral authority. To, moral authority to say, folks, you have to listen to me. And I had to be fair to them. I mean, when I gave the equity, that is day in itself, I showed that money is not important to me. This challenge, this entrepreneurial journey is more important. Therefore, in this journey, all of us have to sit together, discuss, and finally there should be one person whose 
words will have to be listened. And that privilege has to be earned in a very earned. tough way. It doesn't come cheap. So you're saying in the founding team, there has to be one leader who has the ultimate say. Yeah, absolutely. Now, how should the leader behave? What are the characteristics of the leader? What should the leader do to demonstrate leadership? First of all, that leader has to lead by example in aspiration, in hard work, in discipline, in sacrifice, etc., etc. Now, for example, you've known me. I used to leave office, uh, be in the office at 6.20 in the morning. Be the last to leave home at 6 o'clock. And you and I used to leave the lost. So nobody could come and tell me, no, no, you're not working hard. You are, you, you know, you are expecting us to work hard. First of all, I didn't have to tell anybody, anybody because they were watching. And the moment they know that I was working hard, then I didn't have to tell them. That's number one. Number two, I had sacrificed the biggest because getting a similar job if Infosys failed in the India of that day was very difficult. The youngsters all knew. For them, it was very easy. Instead of this job, they could have become software engineers not elsewhere. Not but you. not for me in the job that I was handling. So they had seen that I had sacrificed much more than all of them put together. Whether it was equity-wise, whether it was salary-wise, in any way, I had done that. The third thing is in the values. That is, in terms of coming to the office on time, in hard work, you know, in, uh, in traveling by economy. I never said, no, no, I will travel by business class. You people travel by economy. That doesn't. And I don't know, Mohan, if you remember, when we went to Bangalore Club for membership, they talked to all of us and they said, we find something strange in your company. Nandan was there, I was there, and probably Ravan and Chris. We asked, what is it? Said, this is the only company we have come across where the MD is about 11 years older than others, and he gets the same salary as others. <laughs> we all took the same salary. Yes. Right from 1991 or 92 till I left. Yes. Yes. Therefore, I think it is very, very important that a leader has to demonstrate his ability to sacrifice, his ability to work hard, you know, his ability to be disciplined, and then you will build trust in other people. That's very, very important. So for the leader to ensure that ultimately decisions are executed without anybody questioning, after questioning and coming to a conclusion, that moral authority is important. Absolutely. And the moral authority is built upon leadership by example yeah. and by deep sacrifice. Well said. But it led me out also. It is the responsibility of the leader to create an environment where new ideas come up easily. There is discussion and debate. Everybody could disagree without being disagreeable. And there is a certain percentage or at least one expert in that field where you know we are discussing the, uh, the issue. And finally, it is the leader's responsibility to listen to everybody, give everybody opportunity to voice their opinion within that limited time for that decision and then pronounce his or her uh, decision. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. Doesn't a work. committee cannot make a decision. Committee they cannot. No. You were senior by 10, 11 years. You have done much more. Yeah. You are more visible. You are extremely brilliant. And everybody acknowledged that. How did you subdue your ego, every human being has an ego, when you met a lot of people, including founders, and you listened to everybody, including a rookie who just joined yesterday and created an atmosphere where there was no fear to speak out, to disagree with you vehemently, like some of us have done in public. Of course. And 
ensure that you take the decision on merit clinically without emotion. I mean, how do you make it happen? See, one of the most important uh, requirements for successful teamwork or successful interaction is deciding every transaction based on data and facts. The good thing about data and facts is that it will bring a sense of fairness. You what know, you remember, uh, Mohan, we had introduced this open uh, uh, evaluation of employees. That is, the individual who was being evaluated and his or her immediate boss had columns to write about the performance of the individual in each of the attributes. 360 degrees. 360, I'll come to later, yeah. but I'm saying only yeah. these two. Yeah. And if the variance between the uh, employee and his or her boss yes. was more than a certain percentage, it would go to the skip level manager. Yes. And that skip level manager would then decide who is right, who is wrong, and he or she would write down his or her valuation. That meant the employee had an opportunity to be listened to and number two, to see what the bo boss has written. It was not confidential report at all. Nothing, nothing was confidential. And that raises the confidence of the person. Number two, when you use data and facts, which all these evaluation evaluators did, they would say, look, I'm giving you this, uh, whatever, three out of five, because on this instance, this instance, this instance, this is what happened, I didn't agree with you. Then the, the employee has an opportunity to say, no, that didn't happen. So when you use data and facts, when you explain to the other party why you are taking this decision, what these data items are saying, what the employee will feel is that if I had better data for me, in the, I would have won this transaction. So next time when he or she comes to uh, a decision with you, he or she will come out with a better set of data. And then there is a sense of fairness. And this is very, very important if you want to raise the confidence of your people. That, that's what we did. But uh, once you've taken the decision, it has to be executed, and then you can't deviate. That you're very clear. There is no democracy in execution. Sorry, yes. I don't believe in democracy in execution. Democracy in discussion and debate is possible, huh. is helpful. And it is the responsibility of the leader to identify or to separate intelligent input from not so intelligent input and imbibe those intelligent inputs and then articulate his decision or her decision based on all, all those intelligent input and then say, this is what I have decided. And you have and to do it. After that, no there is no democracy. You know, for example, it is the architect who designs, who, 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 who uses creativity to design a building. But a bricklayer cannot say, I will lay one, one brick like this, another brick like this. It doesn't work. The wall will not stand. So there is an area in every organization for uh, discussion, debate, democracy, merit, all of that. But there are several processes, several aspects of the running of the organization where you have to simply execute based on based on a certain manual. You know, we, we had yeah. all these uh, yeah. quality manuals, yeah. right? There, there is no democracy, there is no discussion, no debate. But, but if you think that something goes wrong with the decision, decision doesn't work, how would you as a leader react? No, I think, uh, first of all, it is the responsibility of the leader to take bottom line responsibility, bottom responsibility as far as the public is concerned. However, 
within the organization it is very important for the person who was whose decision it was and the leader to sit down and then say friend this decision did, didn't go well for these these reasons with the way i analyzed it next time kindly don't do that however there are areas where this cannot be done in other words once you violate the values of the organization there is no forgiveness there is no forgiveness, is no forgiveness. that forgiveness. person has to find either or opportunities elsewhere values you cannot negotiate however decisions you know uh, whatever one did uh, with the best of his or her intelligence best of his his or her intentions they're okay that's okay that's okay yeah. but tell me uh, leadership is very lonely right <laughs> leadership you... is extremely lonely because you are right at the top you are right at the top i've Thank seen you, you agonize about some decisions yeah. Yeah. and you have said let me think about it and you went home i don't know whether you slept but you came back the next day and you decided how lonely it is it being a leader i mean uh, what goes in your mind and your heart when you are take a very important decision when you are the fork in the road you know i have found that while leadership is very lonely the the memories of the joys and in some cases the challenges that you have faced in the organization that is really what gives you company in the night when you are thinking about it in the office when you are sitting alone thinking about it if i take this decision in the past these are the things that have happened these are the positive these are the negative i i enjoyed those successes i uh, wept for those mistakes so i think in some sense the the experiences that you have gone through within the organization is your only companion only companion only there's nobody else and uh, you have been obsessed if i can use the word pardon me with infosys is 24 into 7 your life your possibility today in your mind and um, your family your children you spend more time on infosys what made you do that because in your life work life balance something somebody calling work life balance spending time with family going for holidays at periodic intervals and uh, you know reducing your time in the company as you, you never did that you were obsessed about building a world class organization you know, and even more, today yeah. you seem to have the same kind of passion and how do you keep it going for so many years and and what makes you do that what made you do that no more on uh, look at the entire world look at whatever fields you want to look at the reality is that most people who were in charge of either an institution for a certain period of time or who founded something or people who were leaders of a nation people who created the nation for example look at mahatma gandhi he was not very successful in his family similar examples exist for mandela he was not very successful so wherever you look at when you are attached to your passion when you are thinking about it all your waking hours when you are spending all the disposable hours with that institution it is quite possible mm -hmm. that you would not be judged a successful family person but in my case i was very very lucky very lucky because my wife herself was a professional she was yeah. a senior engineer in tatas 
she understood this and she told me when we found it when i found it in physics i will look after the children i won't worry you about their uh, issues you go ahead and look after your child in physics as a human being as an individual yeah you have a responsibility to everybody around you you have to spend time with the children with your wife with your parents with your friends and all that how does one reconcile this passion for a company passion to build something to do something great with that responsibility do you as an individual accept that you can't do everything you may not be successful but you want to focus on this and do it and is that okay to do it in your life well you know you look at people who have achieved something almost everybody without exception provided total devotion to that task and the moment you do it you are unlikely to be very successful in other areas whether they were academicians even einstein einstein was a classical example mahatma gandhi einstein you name it anyway the therefore what you need is a companion who will support you very well and children who understand it and make the best out of whatever little time you can provide them for example when our children were very small i would come home by about 9 915 and then i would take them out to macfast on that road i forget church street you know because they like their pizzas they like whatever it is three times a week so oh. <laughs> and that was quality time quality. then nobody no, would disturb me that was completely reserved for the children both akshata and rohan and sudha and i we made the best use of that so i think there is always a way to maximize the pleasure happiness and satisfaction but some people get that extraordinary opportunity those people will have to make the the compromise that i spoke about compromise life is it's not series, for everybody life is a series of compromises except your values yeah exactly. values you don't compromise absolutely absolutely now uh, what is your abiding passion what has been your abiding passion since you started infosys till today one abiding passion well it was uh, being fair in every transaction so many times people including you have asked me what do you want your epitaph to be when you are dead and gone i said i would ideally like it to say here lies a man who tried to be fair in every transaction tried to be fair tried to be fair in some place sometimes i have failed there is no doubt absolutely but after, after all i am a human being but in most transactions i have tried to be as fair as possible so conscience I, is important that's very important very very important and conscience gives you happiness and uh, that's why i said uh, i have many times said a clear conscience, conscious a, a clear conscience is the softest pillow is the softest pillow a clear conscience is the softest pillow thanks for reminding me about that that's how you are said often when you build a founding team you should have mutually exclusive collectively exhaustive skills yeah can you explain what that means well uh since you and i are both mathematically oriented you know it's very clear to you but uh, basically what i meant was that everybody has to be competent everybody has to have a certain level of intelligence because intelligence is what provides you learnability the ability to learn new things however just learnability alone is not sufficient 
because there is a certain value for experience that is the knowledge of how things work when you found the company that is where you need to bring people from different areas of expertise that together create a strong foundation for the company what are those i believe sales number 1 finance number 1 is sales yeah number 2 is finance number 3 is human resources number 4 is technology production and all of that and then there is r and d but to me you know many times i have upset some of my anger co-founders when i said sales is number 1 finance is number 2 human resources is number 3 uh but the reality is this there are two major attributes for the enduring success of a company and they are access to market share second access to the best talent now access to market share and access to best talent both require good finance knowledge because the finance person has to realize what all the strategic inputs and therefore he or she will have to uh allocate required amounts to obtain these strategic inputs which are market share branding you know all of that and people so therefore my view is that when people build a team they need to focus on sales uh then uh, finance human resources and others however the there is an important underlying attribute in all this and that is innovation innovation should not be the prerogative of a chosen few in an organization or a committee or a group yeah it cannot be of a certain committee you can't say quality is the responsibility of the quality quality department no quality is the responsibility of every function and every individual in the company similarly innovation is the responsibility of every function and every person in the company and sales people are very important because they are all the time listening to customers. prospects and customers and the prospects will tell you why they could not choose your product or your services with we somebody else and that input has to immediately go into the company into the relevant people and they have to start thinking how can we make sure that next time we don't lose that transaction so similarly the finance people have to bring lot of innovations into enhancing the transparency of the company and you have done that so i don't need to tell you that but the reality is that if you want to enhance the trust of the people you need good corporate governance and the first requirement for good corporate governance is ensuring that your transparency is at the highest level so i would say that sales finance talent preservation talent attraction you're making sure that the talent is happy i am making sure that the tired mind that leaves the company at <laughs> whatever time 6 o'clock in the evening comes back enthusiastic and energetic next morning to add value to the company these are all very important that's what i what are fundamental principles of selling and finance that you like to tell founders of young companies that they should follow always yeah you know economists say 
price is what you pay. Price is what you pay. Value is what you expect. Therefore, the responsibility of every organization, no matter what product they sell, what services they sell, is to maximize the ratio of value or price. That is, for every dollar that you seek from a prospect, if you happen to be providing the best value, I can assure you, you will win all transactions. So therefore, I would say that every salesperson, every organization has to spend some time with the marketing team, with the production people, with whatever else, with the technology people to say, how can we provide the best differentiated value, whether it is business or consumer value, based on what area you are in, per dollar that the customer face. So as long as the CEO focuses every day on enhancing the differentiated value per dollar vis-a-vis -vis the competitors, then that organization has a very, very high chance of succeeding with uh, longevity. And finance, what are the principles of finance you followed? I mean, you, you, you are extraordinary in your understanding of finance, uh, you know, for Infosys. You know, I mean, I've learned a lot from you, so if I say whatever it is, in some way, I'm repeating what you have taught me. Uh, I have realized that profit is an opinion. The only real happiness comes from cash in the bank. Cash in the bank. And I used to exasperate you by saying, show me where that money is. <laughs> we would say, okay, we, if we have to So you have count, to make profits, you, yeah. no losses. No. I don't believe in, uh, well, in in the building up period, initial period, that in be. today's scenario, it is it's, it may not be possible. But I came from services where it is possible to obtain some advances with very trusted customers and then try and make sure that you're profitable. It's not possible in products. I fully understand. I appreciate it. But... When you reach the steady state, even today, then every quarter, you have to see whether you are making more profit than everybody else who is competing. So profit is very important. Profit is, I am not a great believer in just top line. I believe in both top line and bottom line. And to me, top line makes sense only if there is a good bottom line. And you are a great person at, uh, let us say, giving full empowerment to people. So long as they met your top line expectation, the bottom line expectation, in between their full freedom, right? <laughs> well, often <laughs> I have had this discussion with you. <laughs> Probably there is no discretion. <laughs> but the reality is that CEO and the CFO, they face investors quarter after quarter. And it is the responsibility of these two people to ensure that there is enough money to pay proper compensation to employees, to pay all the vendors on time, and to pay whatever dividend to investors, all of that. And to do that, there's only one person, and that's a customer. customer. And therefore, you have to obtain the required price from the customer so that you have enough bottom line. Enough bottom line. Without bottom line, in the steady state, there is no point in running a business. I would not. Now, uh, in the founding team, how do you resolve conflicts as a leader? No, be, before I come to that, may I yes, add yes, one please. more? Yes. And that is, while profit after tax is important, even 
more important is free cash flow. Free cash flow. Because when you have the profit after tax, which gets added to accrued income and all of that, uh, accrued funds, then you have to allocate it to many things. But for me, after doing all of that, how much of cash you have? That therefore free cash flow is extremely important. So top line for most people, top line and bottom line for me, and free cash flow. These are the three important things they have to keep in mind. Now, I think we should have a master class on finance. We'll do it separately. But tell me, how do you resolve conflicts within uh, founding teams? There could be conflicts because there could be differential performance between people over a period of time. Business may not do well. There could be dark time for a long period of time. Conference could, yeah, people could give up. How did you keep your team together? And, and how did you resolve conflicts if at all they arose? And what are the principles you need to follow? Well, if there is a violation of values. No forgiveness. No forgiveness. Then they have to leave. Second, if it is on an issue where they tried their best and it is not a value system thing, then you can sit down with them, understand why they failed, and suggest how they could improve. Uh, third, after reviewing their performance over a certain period after that failure, if they still have not improved, then they have to leave. They have to leave. Yeah, we had at Infosys, remember, you know, you, I think it was you or uh, Hema or somebody who had uh, designed what is called uh, PIP, yes. Performance Improvement Program. Yes. If a software engineer did not perform well, then we would put him or her in a, a PIP, PIP, then provide a mentor to them, make sure that the boss spends more time compared to other software engineers. And if this employee did not put in extra hard work, did not show the required discipline, did not show the required aspiration to improve, after six months, we would say, friend, I think our paths have diverged. You please go on your path, we will go on our path. So there's no forgiveness and performance and incompetency over time for the founding team too. You hold them to the same standard. We have to hold them to even higher standard. Higher standard. But you have to give them an opportunity yes, yes, to course. improve. Yes, now, sir. you know, I have a certain view that in we will have to come out with a new model of equity allocation to even founders. Even founders. That is very important. Because what happens is this. When you form the team, you would not have had the opportunity to work as closely as you expect to in the past. Therefore, you have some assumption about the competencies and values of individuals. Now, how do you, what is the insurance to make sure that the competencies and the value system of the members of the team, including the leader. Including Here, the leader. Absolutely, absolutely, is truly followed. And that is, instead of saying, okay, I will keep 30%, uh, you keep 15% in the beginning before I found the team. We have to say, look, at the end of five years, you will get certain percentage. At the end of 10 years, you will give certain other percentage. After 20 years, you will get the full percentage, provided you have, you are in the top 5% of performance in your function in the company or in the industry. The moment we come out, the moment uh, government allows us to come out with such, a, such a, an equity allocation. Uh, allocation mechanism, then the, the problem that arises because you expected some of your colleagues to perform at a certain level and then you gave them the equity and then they didn't perform, I think 
that is very disappointing for all the members of the team. Even I'm talking about the leader also. Leader also. So in order to avoid that, I think we have to come out with uh, a performance review with clear KPIs at the end of five years, 10 years, 15 years, and 20, maybe even 25 years, so that they will enjoy the fruit of their entire labor at the end of 25 years rather than just saying, okay, I have finished five years, now I have got my money, I will leave the company. I think that... I so, so founders have a continuing obligation to the enterprise to justify their ownership. Absolutely, absolutely. Continuing. Absolutely. You can't walk off. No, I mean... You should it, not walk off. You should not walk out because at the end of the day, it is like your child. And who walks off from the child? When you found a team and when the, the team is, when the, when the company is performing well, but you are not performing well, that means you have a responsibility to work harder, to work smarter, to be more disciplined, all of that. You can't say, no, you people work hard, I will retire and then I will go and enjoy. That, what kind of nonsense is that? That's no, a value I mean, system. No, no. It's a value system uh, violation. So you have an obligation. Absolutely. And uh, when do you allow or accept other people coming into top management when you have a founding team? No, I'll, I'm, I'm glad you said that, Mohan. As part of the, the modification to the employee stock options uh, scheme or stock option scheme, I would also suggest that extraordinary people who come into the company after it is founded, they too must be enrolled in this pool. And they also will have the same thing. Uh, there cannot be that you will get 15% uh, whether you add value or not value. No, no. It should not be there. The leader must have a certain flexibility, not leader, you can say that there should be a committee of honest, fair and details oriented people who will say, these are the people that are in the pool, some joined the company in the beginning, some have joined later and we will decide how they are performed from time to time and at that point of time we will decide who benefits how much? Now, that's a very radical uh, proposition that you're making. Are you also saying that a company may have a founding team at one point of time? The founding team should have continuous performance evaluation. If they don't perform after time, they have to leave. And the founding team should be flexible to allow other people to come into the so-called founding team and to share in a, in a, in a pool of equity yeah. that accrues to them. Yeah. So the founding team continues as a continuum and does not end yeah. at the initial founding team. So the enterprise always has a set of leaders fully committed to the enterprise. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, in some way, what I'm saying, Mohan, is you can even say, okay, 70% or 60% goes to the founders and 40% is reserved for uh, some senior people who will add similar value of the founders and then there is the employee stock option plan that's okay. all and then okay. you go public all of okay. that that is separate okay i am talking of only the founding team, team. <laughs> that founding team concept should not be frozen at the time the company was founded it we must have flexibility to to uh, enroll new people who have extremely high uh, competence and, and commitment and value system. And then without perhaps hurting the founders much, these people also should have ability to enjoy. So you can say 60% for the founders, new 40% is reserved for the new. That, that's also Now, uh, you created a world-class organization in Infosys. How do people aim to and create a world-class organization? How do you define what is a world-class organization? And how do you ensure that you take the steps to create one? Just uh, well, the first responsibility of a leader 
is to raise the aspirations of the people. Everybody. Yeah, everybody. That's where, remember, Moses stood in front of the sea and said, we will walk on water. The sea parted. That's a different issue. But he had raised the confidence of people to walk on water. Now, that is the responsibility of a leader. Therefore, a leader has to start out with the highest level of aspiration. In the corporate world, what is the highest level of aspiration? It is to say that we will compete ourselves with the best in the world by understanding what the attributes of this particular company is. We will learn from them. We will work very hard to adapt those attributes, succeed, and hopefully over a little bit of time, we can do better than them. That level of aspiration has to be imbibed by everybody in the organization, by every function. If you remember, Mohan, when we were operating in the 90s, we had different companies for, uh, for uh, our benchmarking in different areas. We had GE for uh, GE uh, in finance because GE produced quarter after quarter, quarter after quarter. Those days. Growth, you know, and then profitability. Then we had Hewlett Packard. Of course, this was pre, what's that lady? I forget her name. Uh, time when uh, uh, Bill Hewlett and David Packard were there, I think. Uh, we, that was our aspiration for human resources. Then we had Motorola. It doesn't exist today, but we had Motorola for quality. Yeah. So the point I'm making, Mohan, is look at the uh, database, the identify the world's best company in your area of expertise, understand why they are there, what are their attributes, then articulate that vision to your people and say, we want to reach there first. It will take a long time to reach. And then once we reach, we want to become better. I think if every leader in the company, every a leader of every function, then there is a hope for us to create a lot of global class companies. This is an exciting episode, Mr. Murthy. Thank you very much for talking to us about creating great founding teams and creating world-class organizations. 